So I am here doing a fungus survey. And oh, so wow. I'm just, um, I got like 20 study plots. And I'm kind of going around to all these plots, just like uh, documenting all the fungi I can see. They're, they're doing this uh, fungal survey. It's kind of like their ecological awareness program. Wow. That's awesome. Oh, fun. Yeah. And it's Pretty like a new, new pro um, it's a new program, like through Apple or is it through the fundus program? Nothing to do with fundus. It's um, it's just the company Apple wants to know which mushrooms they have growing on their campus. Like they got oh, a pretty big cool. campus here, and they've done a lot of landscaping. They like planting, like all sorts of, you know, different wow. trees and you know so all sorts of stuff in their landscaping. And so, I was wanted to see yeah. like what kind of uh, what kind of stuff they have here. And this is the first time they've ever done a survey. Yes, this is the first one. What? That's so cool. I hope that you have somebody documenting it. Make a cool Mycena video. Um, I mean, it's just like a regular corporate job, so I'm not really filming a lot of videos here. Yeah. Um, who knows if they want to have their stuff filmed without all sorts of paperwork. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> so will you be putting all your observations on iNaturalist or do they want it for their own records? Well, I didn't tell them about iNaturalist, but that is how I keep track of everything. So yeah, I'm putting everything in iNaturalist. And then when they ask for the report, so I just pull up my iNaturalist observations and download it as a CSV. I'm like, okay, here's your report. Nice. Nice. Yeah, you yeah, reminded me, um, well. I need to start posting my stuff on Mushroom Observer again. I was throwing a bunch of stuff up there and uh, a lot of people will message me like, hey, can you send me a sample? And um, I met with Dr. Jaya there at UMS in Saba, and he was like warning me about biopiracy and all sorts of stories about, you know, people coming in and he's a bit secretive. So um, I was wondering if I can pick your brain a little later about what your opinions are on biopiracy and some of these black zones in, in that part of the world, because, you know, I wanted to upload and share. And he's like, hey, maybe uh, pump the brakes on that. And I'm like, well, hey, Alan says, you know, open science and hey, I want to be like him. <laughs> why can't I why yeah. can't I share this? I mean, um, you know, it's kind of like a difficult issue because they made these all these biopiracy laws. So pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies can't get rich, like yes. discovering some new drug and some kind of fungus in some faraway place. But unfortunately, it also outlawed a lot of citizen science. And yeah. it's, you know, kind of this patchwork of laws. Nobody really knows where you're allowed to collect and where not to, where you're allowed to send it, where you're not. Maybe some people know, but you'd have to, like, really study up on the rules in every it's, different place. But yeah, I never me, make like, any money on, on any of my collections. I just study them for science. So I just yes. study whatever I can and don't worry about that kind of stuff. But yeah. um it certainly can annoy some people because they're like, wait, we have these biopiracy laws and, um, you know, like the law doesn't really make any, you know, distinction between people that are doing, you know, doing the research for, mm -hmm. you know, just, just for science or, or whatever. And then, you know, you can always get permits to do this kind of stuff, but it's a lot you know, sometimes the permits are really expensive. A lot of times they'll only give it to university students and, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I usually just, uh, you know, just go ahead and do it until somebody complains. And people don't yeah. usually complain, but occasionally they do. And then, you know, I'll just take the sequences down and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tell my friends in Malaysia, you know, as an American, we say shoot first, ask questions later. But I try to, you know, play by the rules over there. It's taken about like six months just to try and navigate and, and connect and get with the right people. So, um, yeah, yeah, a lot well, of people ask, like, to every, if you, you can, told me you're like, like, every photo you take, you should have a, a collect that specimen. And yeah, um, for sure. I, I don't make it publicly known, but I do have other connections. So a lot of these like I have a folder for like secret species that I found and then like I'm not sharing it like to the public on Facebook or anything but I they're getting sequenced but it oh, hopefully won't really come good. back to me <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, this is and, gonna be you know, you, might, you can always upload the stuff to GenBank under like a, a different name because I don't like mm. affect the name on anything. You know, the most important thing is that the sequence gets added, so then the next time somebody sequences the same thing and they blast it, then um, you know, then then they can see the match and and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, it's also how important your just to se sequence it yourself, just so you know what it is that you're I photographing. And the next time you see it, you have a much better idea. You're like, oh yeah, I have some insight yeah. into that thing. I uh, I took your course for the DNA barcoding. It was really insightful, and I learned a lot from it. It's just trying to figure out how do I get like um a lightweight kind of setup because I'm always traveling and I only bring carry on with me, so. Yeah, I well, I mean, you're able the, to do it in your bringing car, the mushrooms like... to the lab is a lot easier than bringing yeah. the lab to the mushrooms. Um, <laughs> but you certainly could do like a lightweight thing, but it'd be much better. Like there's um, there's the Ohio Mushroom DNA Lab will sequence mm -hmm. anything for free. And so um, if you just send everything to the Ohio Mushroom DNA Lab, then you can get everything sequenced. And it's Kyle Cannon just uh, runs it in his nanopore. And so... That's probably a lot easier than like trying to um, trying to like bring a PCR machine everywhere with you and everything. <laughs> yeah. um, but the best thing to do would be if you could um, team up with some people there that have permits to collect and all that kind of stuff. Then yeah. you can like collect legally under somebody else's permit, and then nobody can be annoyed that something was collected or whatever. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's all good information, yeah. That's what we did in Ecuador. We teamed up with a, a whole bunch of scientists that already had permits to collect on there. And so we're able to get everything into the herbarium and sequenced and all of that. Amazing. And you're in the same area as Steve Axford too, right? Like going to some of the same places? Or is he in a different part of um, Asia? When he travels in Asia, he's going he, to different areas. He's like... Uh, he goes to like northern India. I think I saw him. Um, some of the islands. I don't know if he went to Vanuatu, but he's like Australian, so he's around in the. It, I think I've seen him in Thailand as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, he's been to some Southeast Asian countries, and a lot of the species there in Australia are, are similar to the ones I'm seeing in Borneo because it's Gondwan in distribution. So it's like. He'll ask for IDs or he'll share some photos. I'm like, hey, that one looks similar. I saw that one, you mm -hmm. know, in Borneo or, or, or Malaysia. Um, but yeah, I know he was doing like a new I documentary, see. like Chasing the Rain or or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, I saw that one. They were doing like a GoFundMe or a fundraising campaign. Yeah. But he might have some other, or might recommend like working with different people in the area as well. Yeah, because I was in Chiang Mai last and I saw Genevieve Gates. Uh, she works closely with, I guess, University of Chiang Mai. And mm -hmm. then um, there are other people. Dennis Desjardins, I haven't met yet, but he does a lot. He'll come out to Thailand. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see I that like guy all the time because he's in San Francisco. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's like a legend, I guess, in Asia because he does a lot of the bioluminescent work as well. I've read a lot of his papers. Like, I'm really obsessed with bioluminescent mushrooms. So uh, I actually got inspired by you, Alan, and seeing your photos. And Oh, cool, yeah. Le learned a lot about that. So, um, Yeah, you know, these days I photo stack all of them. And so, you know, it really helps to be able to keep the aperture all the way open and everything. I need to pick your brain about some techniques because I've got, I mean, in my talk today, I'll, I'll share my gear, but it's a lower end uh, EM5 Mark III Olympus camera. And these crop sensors, I think they produce like some of the noisiest uh, bioluminescent photos. I don't know what the deal is, but I do yeah. a lot of post-processing. I think something like a, a Nikon Z6 might be a good uh that's <laughs> out of my use, tax bracket has... that's a little too rich for my blood man hey i don't think the I z6 saw... is that expensive anymore because it's been out for a long time and there's a lot of the oh, okay. market now that the z8 is out 
but you know something like that has only 24 megapixels but a full frame sensor so something with a really big sensor but not very many megapixels you're going to get the best performance on with low light mm. yeah i might need to upgrade my gear yeah, yeah the only problem but with you're... nikon and the only reason i don't recommend nikon is that when you're focus stocking the screen goes black so you can't see the pictures as you're taking them so yeah, that's kind that. of a bummer because with the Olympus, <laughs> you can see exactly where you are and you can like light it differently at different focus, you know, it, where it's going to focus different places or you can just, uh, you know, tell it to take a lot of pictures and then stop it when it's done. Whereas with Nikon, you guess how many pictures you need and it's either wow. too many or not enough. And then you can start it again if it's not enough, but it's just kind of a pain. Wow. Yeah. I, I've seen that where people are touching their camera on the touchscreen. It just goes black. I'm like, well, how do you know when to stop? Because on the Olympus, it's yeah, so smooth. Yeah, you just guess. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, I wish well, I could get the OM1. Oh, hey, see you. Hey. All right. Well, I'm going to um, just kind of welcome everyone. Uh, we're getting a little bit close to seven. We've got oh. Cameo from the 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 famous Alan Rockefeller. He's doing a survey at Apple right now, and he popped in. Excited to see him joining us. But we'll get started in another few minutes. I'll have a few announcements here at the beginning. Uh, but we are doing uh, a live stream on YouTube as well. So anything from tonight, you can recap and watch back on the YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, and we're also going to be doing a giveaway of this book here. Um, it's a more of an illustrated book, but, uh, it's written by, um, Alex Dorr, illustrated by Sarah Richards. So it's a beautiful gift book. And it's got a bunch of beautiful illustrations in it of a bunch of different types of mushrooms and wonderful facts about them. So we'll be doing a little trivia at the end. So definitely stick around to the end and um, we'll do a little game. But um, yeah, so we tonight we're gonna be talking about um, mastering macro mushroom photography with Joseph Palente. And he's joining us all the way from, you said you're in Borneo right now? No, I'm in Vietnam. Vietnam. Da Nang, da Nang yeah. Vietnam. Morning, it's 8 a.m. for him right now. Um, so yeah, so we met this last su summer here in Texas uh, while he was visiting family. Joseph grew up in Houston area and was in Austin and swung by one of our many events that we have. Um, and was telling me about how inspired he, he has been by a lot of the other um, mushroom, macro mushroom photographers, including Alan and, um, and others. And so it's a real treat to have Alan join us tonight. But um, he's going to be sharing some of his techniques of some of the beautiful photos that we've been sharing on the social media um, and we'll get to see a bunch of them in the presentation today as well. Um, but yeah, we'll get started here in about five after. We'll give people a few minutes to show show up. Um, but to, in Austin area, and let's see, we have three events coming up leading us to the end of the year. Tomorrow, we're going to be at Cosmic uh, Coffee in South Austin uh, Austin Davenport is going to be doing a um, giveaway. We'll have some of our merch, some of our new shirts. I'm wearing one right now. Uh, it's got our state mushroom on it. We worked with an artist actually also out of Houston. Her name is Sarah. Um, she's part of a, a collective. They do the Houston Zine Festival as well. They're called Mystic Multiples. They do a lot of really cool e eco art and things like that. But yeah, you can get yourself a Texas Mushrooms uh, illustrated shirt uh, with some Texas stars, a couple of other mushrooms on it. And we have a lot of star walks coming up. Um, that's one of the mushrooms that fruits here in the winter. So our state mushroom, Coriactris giaster, um, 
It's uh, been popping up all over the place. I went on a walk today at Shoal Creek and found about 50 of them. There's so many. It was like every cedar elm stump that I walked to, there was a bunch of stars popping out or cigars. So it was like cigars and stars like all over the place. And this mushroom is really unique to our region because it only grows it, along kind of the I-35 corridor up to the Oklahoma border about Choctaw County. There's been some observations in Wharton County as well, which is closer to Galveston. Um, and then it also has been found in uh, Japan in the 70s. They found it in Japan. Um, they In the 90s, they even did some DNA to uh, try to understand the the, the how you know the 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 um difference i guess like the um i'm not sure what kind of techniques they were using but they were able to determine that the the mushroom wasn't introduced by humans and it was actually separated it's separated by 19 million years and then this year eric cho who you all may um know who's famous for taking the picture and i believe this is the same on this slide here, is it the same mushroom, Joe? Yeah, I actually had the pleasure of meeting Eric Cho. He came out to visit uh, me and my friends in Kuala Lumpur, and I spent a few days with him and got to learn how he takes his photos. It's really amazing. Uh, but it's yeah, the same species, a okay. beautiful tiny blue mushroom, a mycena. Yes, so this mushroom... He took the beautiful photo. I think it's like the main photo in iNaturalist. You probably see it all over the internet. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful macro photo. Well, he messaged me on uh, Instagram and uh, shared that uh, some mycologists in Taiwan had also found Texas stars as well. I mean, they're not Texas stars. They were all making jokes like, it's a Taiwan star. <laughs> And so that's why common names are a little bit <laughs> like they can be a little bit misleading. And so when, of course, we were able to get a state mushroom pass by calling it a Texas star, like appealing to everyone's sort of like Texas pride. And you know how people are in Texas. They really love their uh, their state for <laughs> many bad and good reasons. <laughs> um and so, so yeah, so we've been going out and doing a bunch of walks. So we have a walk coming up on the 20th at our botanical garden. So it's um, the middle of the day. So uh, if you can join on the 20th, that's happening. And then there's another one on January the 6th at our botanical garden as well. And so we'll just kind of go over the ecology um, we'll go over how you can find them because they're going to continue to fruit uh -huh. every time it rains um, throughout the winter. Uh, so yeah, so and we love when people find them and share share their photos with us online. You can add them to iNaturalist. Um, I've been tagging all the ones that I'm finding on iNaturalist. So if you're in the Austin area, just go on to iNaturalist, look for the Texas star mushroom, search for it, and then go out and um, go out and uh, go to that same location and and check it out and learn how to uh, kind of its its uh, ecology. But yeah, I like to talk a lot about this mushroom. This is sort of our our one seasonal mushroom uh, that that uh, we're seeing this time of year. Um, but yeah, so we also have, if you have little ones, we have a class coming up, um, in Cedar park on Saturday or on, on Thursday and, um, Sheila will be teaching that class and it's a mushroom paper craft class. And so we're going to learn all about, um, mushrooms that you can find in this re region. We'll also be making some amanitas, some um, the mushrooms that, that, that people associate with Santa Claus. Uh, actually I have one right here that Sheila made me I can show you Boop. Boop. right here. And she likes to use a lot of like reuse. Um, these are just kind of fun little like paper, uh, what do you call them? Um, like for cupcakes. Um, so she just finds really crafty ways. So it's a class that's open to families up if you have a little one from like ages five to 12, um, 
the classes for that age range. So yeah, we'd love to see you all there. Um, and then we're doing another, I don't think we have any more block giveaways with tree folks. I think we've kind of ended that until next year. So we've been working with tree folks this year, doing block giveaways with them, teaching people how to um, mix in the, myce the decomposer mycelium with mulch to help their trees uh, cycle nutrients or get nutrients a little bit quicker um, with composting. So definitely come out to one of those events as well. Um, but yeah, so I can't think of anything else unless anybody else wants to share any other announcements, any other events happening in the sphere, the mycosphere. Um, and if not, we'll just get started. I'll turn it over to Joseph or Joe. And again, we'll be doing a book giveaway at the end of the talk today. Uh, so yeah, so stick around. And um, the first person to answer it in the chat will um, win this book. So, so yeah, so let's, I think it's, um, yeah. Let's get started. Nice. Hey, thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, it's a bit early over here. It's morning where I'm at. And um, yeah, I just want to say thanks, Angel, for allowing me the opportunity to talk. Um, this is actually my first time giving a webinar about mushroom macro photography. So I'm curious to see how it goes. <laughs> So like you said, I got to meet you um, back in Texas when it was super hot. So not a lot of mushrooms were out uh, during that time, but um, I got to meet a lot of really cool people there in Austin and connect. And um, yeah, it was just great to meet fellow Michael Files. Um, so I aimed to structure this talk in like three key parts. And each reflects a stage in my own personal journey of developing my macro photography setup and technique. So initially I began with nothing more than my smartphone. I had a Google Pixel 3 phone at the time, and this was back in 2019. And then I gradually advanced to using a macro lens with an affordable uh, Olympus DSLR camera and then eventually I upgraded to a camera body equipped with a focus bracketing feature. So like towards the end, I'm going to cover why stacking is important and then go through my post-production workflow. Um, you know, at the end too, I have a chart that covers various camera brands, uh, highlighting some of the oldest models that include this bare minimum focus bracketing feature. And then it will also have uh, specific terminology and names for similar settings. So like while my talk primarily is related to Olympus cameras, because that's my brand of choice, the concepts and techniques are broadly applied or applicable across different brands. And then lastly, if there's enough time, um, I'll leave around like 20, 30 minutes for any Q and A and then um, where you can reach me if you want to shoot me a message. Um, I love talking about uh, not just photography and macro photography, but mushrooms in general, uh, identification, um, yeah, just anything mushroom related, shoot me a message. So uh, like you were talking about earlier, Angel, uh, yeah, Eric Cho with his famous uh, tiny mushroom that's gone viral. Um, in this photo here, you can see some of my friends were in Bukit uh, gassing in Kuala Lumpur. And you've got you know, my friend here with just the phone. So lots of people are uh, really mushroom mad over there and they have all different ways of taking photos. So I've learned a lot from them as well. Uh, and it's great to go out with friends and learn from each other different techniques and just get behind the scenes and see like, how are you uh, getting your photos? So. I have my own special way of taking photos, um, macro photography, and then um, maybe from this talk, you can extract maybe any kind of tips or tricks or something new. Um, I'm going to gradually start out 
for those that are just new to macro photography, I'll cover some of the basics and then get a little bit more technical towards the end. So my introduction to mushrooms in general and kingdom fungi started in New Zealand. My wife is a Kiwi and we decided to visit around 2019. So we stayed in a rental just outside of a national park called Abel Tasman. And it's a really beautiful place in the Northwest part of the South Island. And it was during the winter. So like no people were there. Like it was just completely empty and no one's visiting or hiking. So it had this whole national park um, as my playground in the backyard. And we had just come from living in Shanghai for like four years in China and Vietnam for another three years. So just getting away from like 24 million people in Shanghai and like eight, nine, 10 million in Hanoi and just being just where there's no people at all, just a bunch of land birds. Um, it, was, it was a real reset um, and, and just really amazing to get back to nature. Um, so I, one day I went out for a jog and I was just startled by this huge spiky alien looking thing. And I had no clue what it was. I just took uh, my phone with me and I just took as many angles as I could. And um, yeah, throughout the winter, I would come across uh, wax caps for the first time and earth stars and Inosai fuzzy caps and little red um, scarlet pouch fungi that attract birds to eat them and disperse um, their spores, uh, Ostropolitis with reticulated stipes, and then Amanita's uh, purple pouch fungus, just these crazy alien looking things, um, beautiful colors, and just mind blowing. And I got super addicted to mushroom hunting and just using my phone. I did this for about a year, um, just going out with just my phone. Also, uh, the white basket fungus, which is just crazy looking, uh, the, the network and just how you can use it as a soccer ball or a football just to kick around. And yeah, so because I was jogging and I only had my phone, I tried the best that I could. Um, and then from that moment on, I wasn't jogging anymore. I was doing like slow snail paced forays, uh, it just was an addiction. I mean, there's worse things that you, that you can be addicted to and mushroom hunting is pretty innocent, I think. Um, so yeah, uh, I joined Facebook groups uh, that dealt specifically with macro mushroom photography. And in New Zealand, there's a really great group there and everyone is super supportive and encouraging and I mean, the one that I was in, the New Zealand Mushroom Photography Group, it just really helped me get inspiration and understand all sorts of gear that people were using. So, yeah, this is the first what the heck is this moment that got me hooked on mushroom photography, uh, the Amanita paraparina or the Maori palisade mushroom, Lepidia mushroom. So... I spent the first year accumulating hundreds of mushroom photos and then uploading them to iNaturalist uh, to get IDs because inevitably I wanted to know the name of what I was shooting. And then by uploading to iNaturalist, I was told, hey, like this photo is bad. Um, <laughs> I, I took a lot of bad photos and they're just like, hey, in order to get an ID, you need different angles. You need to take gill shots. You need to figure out, hey, where is it growing from in situ? So this forced me to shoot differently and not just take one perspective of the mushroom. And this kind of blends art and science. Uh, so I it tried different compositions, different angles. It was super easy to use my phone to get into these positions. Um, yeah, instead of like hovering over a mushroom and taking an aerial shot and then asking, hey, what is this? Uh, that's like the worst way to get an ID. I needed to get closer. So I tried to shoot the underside, the cap, the mushroom in situ, 
any interesting morphological feature that stands out. And for the longest time, I only used natural light, uh, my phone, and then worked on composition and setting the scene. This is an Entoloma hoxteteri or a wary wary kokako. It's on the New Zealand $50 banknote and some joke about which one is rare. Um, so it was around this time that I found this bucket list mushroom and I played around with the idea, you know what, I need to upgrade uh, from using just my phone to something more serious. Uh, every photo I look back on, I kind of cringe. Uh, and when I see it, I'm like, man, if I only knew back then what I know now, I would do so much, so many things differently. So as I give this talk, hopefully, um, it, it's like I'm talking to my old self, like, hey, I would have I had done this better. Um, so, I mean, I like the juxtaposition of the color. I like the blue set against the green moss. But this one right here, as you can see, the stem, the stipe is blurry. It's not in focus. Um, I mean, the surroundings are are nice, but um, I mean, I'm not satisfied with this. So I'm like, hey, I need to up, upgrade. So those of you listening now, you might be at that stage where you're just taking macro photos or just photos with your phone and you're thinking about getting a DSLR camera. So because mushrooms are found in precarious places and it involves a bit of yoga to get the shot, um, my friend in New Zealand refers to it as bush Pilates. With a phone, it's super easy to manage, although it does come with limitations. Some of these phones are getting better and better, but they still can't replace the detail that a DSLR camera can capture. So the first camera I had was this small Olympus Pen Lite EPL6, um, just a word, a mouthful. Um, but basically, it was a super uh, basic camera that was cheap. Um, it came with the stock zoom lens, not a macro lens. It's just a basic one. So the important thing was the camera had manual mode, the M, the big M right here on the dial. This is really important for shooting macro. And generally, most cameras have similar tech and get, can get the job done. So, um, yeah, I remember reverse engineering and discovering other photographers out there that are able to achieve a certain style that I liked. So I would just reach out to them and I saw the cover photo of Fantastic Fungi, uh, the documentary and I'm like, reached out to the lady, how did you get this? And she praised this 60 millimeter lens, uh, M's Waco, uh, 60 millimeter F 2.8. And so did the other photographers. So uh, I should note that it's important uh, to get a prime lens, not a zoom lens for macro photography. A zoom lens typically has a range in millimeters, like 12 to 40 millimeters. You want a static number like 35 millimeters, 60 millimeters, and 90 millimeters. And you want your f-stop number, which I'll get into later, to be like 2.8, um, a pretty low number. So... I quickly realized, as the saying goes, it's not about the camera, but the person behind it using it. Uh, I got this 60 millimeter macro lens. I invested this money. I go out and I try to take these photos and they're just awful. And I'm like, what did I do? I just wasted a few hundred bucks on this lens. Why are my cameras so bad? Um, and then someone told me bluntly, that I should learn how to use my camera. And I repeated this over and over in my head. I'm like, at first I'm like, who's this guy? I think he is telling me this bluntly, um, but he was right. Uh, I had so many questions though. And I'm like, there are so many buttons. I was a technophobe at the beginning. How do I use this thing? So the most important thing to start with is understanding the exposure triangle. Once I learned this, it was like a light bulb moment. And a lot of things just clicked. And the relationship between ISO, your aperture and exposure time or shutter speed uh, is really important to understand. So 
I'm going to start just with Aperture, as I think this is the most important. Uh, I try to shoot with a smaller f-stop number. It's usually between f2.8 and maybe like f5.6. It just depends on the size of the subject, uh, how it's in the frame. So all this means, like when you hear Aperture or f-stop, Usually on old cameras, when you turn it, you'd see these blades. There's usually like six or nine of these blades that turn and it allows uh, the change of your of the size of your lens opening and how much light is allowed to pass through. So when you have a smaller number, like when you see on the macro lens 60 millimeter f 2.8, the 2.8 means that you're going to get a real shallow depth of field. Uh, I'll get into depth of field later and what that really means, but you're looking for that blurry background, that bokeh, some people say bokeh. Bokeh is um, a Japanese word. It originates from Japanese. It means blur or haze. And this term refers to like this aesthetic quality of the out of focus areas in the photograph. It was popularized in the nineties, but different lenses can produce different types of bokeh which can be described as like creamy or smooth, harsh, swirly. Uh, I try to get that nice background color to create um, a better artsy looking aesthetic photo. And towards the end, uh, I'll explain how you can stack a series of shots so you can take a shallower depth of field to create this composite image uh, where you got a lot of detail of the subject up close and then the background is just nice looking. In macro photography, depth of field, you'll see DOF, depth of field is really crucial. So I would say like aperture is the thing you need to think about the most. Keep it low, F2.8, F5.6 within that range maybe. If you take huge mushrooms, you don't really need to focus um, maybe on your aperture being that low. You can make it higher like F7, F16. I'll show you some examples later of single shots. But next up is ISO. Uh, it stands for International Organization of Standardization. They flipped the name around the acronym to be um, uh, international because I think in French, it's International Standardization Organization. But um, yeah, you don't really need to know uh, any of that, except that it determines the camera's sensor sensitivity to light. And this is across all cameras. So um, I never shoot a mushroom without using a tripod. Uh, holding your camera, it's going to open up like a lot of problems if you don't have a bonnet or a, a flash or diffuser. Uh, the way that I shoot, I just keep a real low ISO, uh, maybe around 200 or set it to low. And then on some cameras, you can get more specific and choose like 64 or 32. You want to lower your ISO to remove as much noise as possible or grain. So ISO 1000, as you see in this photo, it's a bit grainy, um, noisy. You're trying to get rid of that because the subjects that you're taking, they're super tiny and you want to capture as much detail as possible. So unless I'm taking like bioluminescent photos where the ISO is 1600, I'm keeping it at 200 or lower. And then lastly, uh, your shutter speed. Um, because it's on a tripod, I don't really focus too much on shutter speed. Uh, it's just not really in my mind. I'm just focused on ISO, keeping it low, and then the uh, aperture being uh, narrow or uh, at a, a low number, F2.8. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're holding your camera and you're juggling and you're trying to take you know, photos of birds maybe, then you'll have your exposure time and your ISO a little higher and you'll be messing around with it. But I can't stress this enough. When you shoot macro, it's so much easier if you have a tripod. So like looking at the camera screen, you'll see your exposure meter and 
this is what you need to pay attention to when you start adjusting your aperture and your shutter uh, speed. The correlation between these three will cause your um, photos to be either overexposed or underexposed. So a plus 0 0.3 on your exposure meter means that it is slightly overexposed. I try to shoot slightly underexposed at negative 0 0.3, negative 0 0.7, negative one, or even more, depending on the color of the mushroom and the harshness of like white light that can blow out a shot. So it's super easy to brighten up an underexposed shot and retain all the details versus darkening an overexposed shot where a lot of details are lost. Um, I won't get too much into uh, like shooting in raw. If you wanna go and do some research, research on your own, shooting in raw uh, mitigates this. It takes up a, a larger file size. Uh, it retains all the information. So it doesn't really matter if you shoot over or under. I shoot personally in JPEG, large, super fine. And uh, I have a 512 gigabyte SD card. So, I mean, technically I could shoot in RAW and retain all those files, but it's pretty big and it involves more post-processing. So these next few photos are just single shots uh, using the DSLR and macro lens that I had. Uh, this was around lockdown in New Zealand. So like, you know, a, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. And as you can see, the f-stop is f11. So this gradually changes as I go through these photos to show you uh, the detail um, and increasing the bokeh in the background. So when I was in New Zealand, I didn't use any artificial lighting. I relied solely on natural light, which created a lot of problems and led to me spending just more time than I should have taking shots that weren't ideal. I was really lucky to get days that offered enough light. And yeah, it just was really frustrating to keep this small Manfrotto tripod that I had steady enough and in, in the camera um, setting in long enough just to deal with the low light and shooting at longer exposure times. But um, this is the same species of the mushroom that I just showed you before. This Hyphaloma uh, australianum is just beautiful. Um, but this one was taken at an aperture, an f-stop of f9. And as you can see, the cap on the top is a little out of focus. Um, I always find fault in some of my old photos because of um, just, I think you're your own harshest critic, but uh, this exposure time was only half a second. Once again, the ISO is low, it's set to 200. Um, but because I was only relying on natural light, only the top of the cap is lit up underneath. It's a bit moody and, and, and darker. I kind of like this photo, um, just how it pops from the background. And I think photography is a combination of luck um, and, and skill. Uh, I think I was just in the right place at the right time just to capture this one. And here's another uh, type of coral fungus that is shot at F9. So the mushroom in the front is in focus, but in the background, it's slightly out of focus. Uh, there's a brown fern frond in between. I liked how this was positioned. I didn't touch this or set this scene. It was just naturally like this. Uh, yeah, it just helps with the background being brown and the, the white mushroom, as I think are some of the hardest mushrooms to shoot. It helps separate the two and there's more depth. This one is also shot at F9, um, a kind of quaternarius white mushroom just hiding in its cave. Uh, the ISO on this one was lower than 200. I put it at 100. Um, and, and yeah, it's just able to get that mushroom in focus at an F9. When you play around with your aperture, uh, you'll be able to see and, and guess 
how much of the mushroom will be in focus. It just takes playing around with and tinkering. So this right here is shot with an aperture of f2.8. And as you can see, the mushroom in the front, the Ruritomyces austroruritis, also known as an austro dripping bonnet, is uh, in the front in focus, but in the back, it's all blurry. I had used no artificial lighting. This was just lucky to get the lighting in the in the way that I the way that I liked it. Um, yeah, and then the background you can see a little more mushrooms uh, blurred out. This is more of an artsy type of shot. So to remind you, this is only one photo being taken. So you can take uh, macro photography without focus bracketing, just one shot. And here's another um, orange pore fungus shot at f2.8. Uh, these mushrooms are, are lined straight. So a lot of it was in focus. The background is still a little uh, blurry, some bokeh in there. So finally getting to preparation and gear. Uh, after a couple of years of trial and error and learning how to use the Olympus system, I upgraded to a lower end model of OM cameras that was crucial uh, for focus bracketing. When I settled on this camera, I needed a few things that were important to me. Uh, first, like I had mentioned before, I had already with me uh, the M's Waco 60 millimeter lens. Photography can be expensive. It's an expensive hobby. Uh, this lens is between 300 to $350. Uh, it hasn't left my camera for like three or four years. I then upgraded to an OMD EM5 Mark III Olympus camera. This one for Black Friday sale was around 700 bucks. Uh, as new cameras come out, the older ones hopefully, hopefully get cheaper. And all I was looking for was a camera that could do focus bracketing, focus stacking, and take long exposure shots. The next piece of equipment I got was an Ulanzi MT20 tripod. This was like 70 bucks on their website. I think they charge over a hundred dollars, um, yeah, tripods are expensive. You'd think they'd be cheaper, but three legs, uh, ball head, 100 bucks. Uh, on this specific tripod, it gets really flat and low. You can fold the legs out. Your goal when you take photos is to try and get as low as you can because mushrooms are low to the ground. Uh, it has a plate that stays affixed to the bottom of the camera, so I can just slide the plate in tighten the screw, the knob, and I'm ready to go. Um, I want a ball head on the top so it's easy to rotate and maneuver the camera. And then I realized, hey, I need to start taking uh, smaller photos or getting more magnification. A lot of people get this Raynox 250. It's just a clip-on lens uh, magnifier that you can put on the on the front of your lens uh, to get more magnification. So I started taking photos of even smaller species uh, like myceets, slime molds, and smaller mycena, and I was able to finally reach them using this cheap uh, magnifier. I think that was around $60, $60-$70 for this. And then I realized I need to start using artificial light uh, it's just not ideal to always rely on natural light. Um, so I got this cheap light cube, 10, 15 bucks. It allows me to control the temperature, the level of brightness. It's super portable. I can fit it in my pocket. It slides on the side of the uh, cold shoe on the tripod. So I can put it there or it slides on the top of the cold shoe or hot shoe on the, the camera. And then lastly, uh, just getting a macro clamp. My friend gave me this uh, before I was using a cheap uh, little clip to hold up twigs and mushrooms uh, on leaves. And then because it has a magnetic base, 
and another arm, you can place a leaf or foliage behind the mushroom to create the background color and juxtaposition you want. So I found that uh, I paid 50 cents for this cheap little clip. And then my friend gave me this one. I think this might be 20, 30 bucks. Um, you get it on Amazon. It's been a game changer uh, to use a macro clamp. Uh, instead of having to position yourself around the mushroom, you can just put the mushroom on the clip and then shoot at an upward angle. It makes life a whole lot easier and it saves your back from a lot of pain. And then lastly, uh, just having a black background uh, using velvet to absorb light. I first started using this when I was shooting bioluminescent mushrooms because at night you want it to be as dark as possible and I would be able to put the mushroom uh, on the velvet in the palm of my hand and it just glows even brighter because uh, it's absorbing any light that could get through from the back. And then I just started applying this to other mushrooms, usually uh, white or little brown mushrooms, LBMs, to capture more detail. Because usually for those lighter colored mushrooms, the backlight that comes through, it, it really kind of, uh, you lose a lot of detail that you would otherwise get. Um, so instead of like spending all of your time adjusting your tripod and yourself to the mushroom, you can adjust the mushroom to your setup. And just doing this, it saves just so much time and you can be more creative because, uh, you know, you can spend more time uh, taking more photos of mushrooms. Um, you block out that background light. Uh, yeah, I took this photo. This was in Thailand. As you can see in the photo on the left, that was the 50 cent clip that I used. I got from Daiso. It's a Japanese store. Uh, yeah, just small changes make a huge impact with macro photography. So I put the twig on there. I found these two uh, gliocephala species. Someone said that in the photo on the right, it looks like a baby's face is in there. Uh, some detail that might not have been caught if there wasn't a black background. So I like to use just the black velvet background. I, I place it further behind. If you have it too close in front, then a lot of the dirt and grit and uh, details will be captured. So if you put the, the black background further away, uh, the background will be smoother, less post-processing time. So by using a macro clamp, uh, you're able to focus more on your camera and getting the settings sorted. So you're not wasting time on composition or setting up your gear around obstacles. This allows for more control when shooting outdoors. So you can get really close up shots. And this one right here is up there with one of the tiniest shots I was able to get with just the 60 millimeter and the Raynox, uh, the magnifying clip on lens, on the uh, glass. So some people ask me like, how do you even see that? And I've got friends that have really good eyes too. And when we go out in Malaysia, we each look for our own interests. So one prefers slime molds, one prefers cordyceps. And I like to find tiny mycena species that tend to grow on wood or leaves. So I'm always inspecting like small leaves and twigs, which force me to look closer. And sometimes I'll be shooting one specimen on a twig and then detect some other even smaller species. So this one right here uh, might be some undescribed Favalacia um, mushroom. And yeah, it was just really tiny um, and red. So I, I think shooting macro not only requires patience, but also like lets one enjoy the process of slowing down and observing their surroundings on a scale that's often overlooked or just impossible to see without a macro lens. 
So I've learned to not only use my camera like as a way to capture the minuscule, but also as a tool to detect smaller mushrooms that are naked to the human eye. And what's really cool is when you're like focused on that one subject and you look closer, you'll just discover more interesting subjects like a happy accident. Um, so this either happens in the field or in post-production and there's been many times when I finish, you know, editing images together to create uh, this one detailed composite image. And then I spot like a colorful insect or a water droplet or cetacean or textures like cystidia, pileocystidia, or tiny hairs that grow from the cat. Various morphologies I didn't catch the first go around. So I think when you get into macro photography and you start using this gear, you should view it as like a tool, as like um, a way to discover this completely different hidden overlooked microverse. And now this one right here is really, really tiny. Uh, I like to maybe sh take one photo and then get many photos from that one photo. So when you are able to do really detailed macro shots, you can just take one shot and then crop it, enhance it, and you can maybe get like three or four different photos from one photo to tell a story. So for this, these are really tiny uh, yellow, I just call them yellow clovers, yellow mycena clovers. Um, and it might be like the tiniest mushroom that I was able to shoot uh, on a leaf, just zooming in and getting as much detail as I can. I think this stretches the max capability of what you can get with a 60 millimeter lens and your Rainox. So this is just to give you an idea of how small you can get. So, one thing about mushroom hunting is having a knack of figuring out like, where do you find these mushrooms? I have so many people asking me like, where do you even like find these? Cause I go out for a hike and I don't see anything. You have to be patient and you have to move slow, deliberate. You're scanning the floor. You're looking for rotten logs, the base of trees, roots, leaf litter. Um, and then after a while, you start to know where the homes of these mushrooms are, you know, where they live. Uh, so I might not know like the name of like a tree species or a plant species, but I'm familiar with that scene. Like you do it long enough. Like, Hey, you know what? I suspect that there's going to be Mycena over here. I suspect that there's going to, it's like a guessing game and it's a lot of fun. So yeah, in this photo, these are my friends in Malaysia. We would go out, and just spend hours uh, looking for weird alien growths and mushrooms. So yeah, I would just recommend if you're gonna get into macro photography, don't go with people that are impatient or wanna go on a hike and just wanna go from point A to point B and just knock it out and just do it, check it off. Like it's, as corny as it sounds, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So yeah, maybe find a group of friends that are patient um, and are also interested in, in taking photos. When I first started taking photos, like I said before, I didn't use any artificial light. Um, so I invested in cheap LED lights. Uh, the Ulanzi, like I said before, 10, 15 bucks, a light cube. Uh, lighting is one of the most important things in photography. So, this might sound counterintuitive, but when I'm out taking photos of mushrooms, I prefer in the early morning when the sun isn't out, I don't want harsh light, but instead overcast or naturally diffused light. Um, I try to get a combination of natural and artificial and keeping that color temperature between maybe like 5,800, 6,000 Kelvin on the small Ulanzi uh, LED light, if you have control over the color temperature, uh, I highly recommend 
keeping it around warm light. Anything over like 6,000 might be considered cold light. Um, you don't get as much natural, rich color details um, in your photos. And then also on some cameras, they will set it to have auto white balance. I like to change mine to cloudy, which is about 6,000 Kelvin. And this provides a more natural color, in my opinion. Um, this is a photo of my two nephews and my dad there in Texas. Yeah, this was when it was 100 degrees outside. Uh, over 40 Celsius, so we couldn't really go out. Um, so I, I took a bit of lichen from outside and I showed them um, what the macro camera can do. Um, when you're out, a good thing to have is an umbrella. Uh, when I was in Malaysia, it was raining all the time during the rainy season, so I'd bring it just for the rain, but it doubled up as a uh, a way to block out dappling light that comes through the canopy. So it's really annoying when you're trying to shoot and stack your photos and then a random sunbeam just blasts your mushroom and then overexposes it and, and ruins the shot. So to control the environment around you the best you, that you can, I would recommend um, bringing an umbrella with you. And this was a Pulvero Belitis powdery sulfur bullet that I found in Dalat, Vietnam. This is 12 images that are stacked um, at f5.6 aperture. And I used an LED light um, with 3% brightness. So on the LED light cube, you want to keep your brightness pretty low, maybe like 5 to 10%. But if you're in a really, really low light setting, sometimes even 2% brightness is good enough. So I also like to take both photos with and without the black background to see the difference. Sometimes it looks better with, sometimes not. Uh, also with the black background, you can get more detail. Uh, as you see on the right, if you were to zoom in on this, you'd see um, cystidia, callocystidia growing little hairs on the stipe otherwise undetectable or maybe blown out from the back background uh, bouquet. And then here's the same photo. Just all I did was put the black velvet background uh, on the back there. And uh, yeah, this is a cordyceps mushroom uh, growing out of an ant, really, really tiny. So one of the last things I'll give my two cents about is composition. I think this is where phone photography has transferable aspects. So like setting up a shot and knowing the relation your subject has to its surrounding can make uh, you be a little bit more creative. And you can just try different angles to give your own perspective. I try to follow a rule of thirds and think proportionately. Uh, although I don't really like fuss too much. Um, with getting the perfect composition. If I know that later I can just rotate, crop the image and make it look how I want it. Uh, but by following a grid format and guiding your eye along horizontal and vertical lines, these can either be imaginary or on your camera, you can have it set to show the nine blocks, uh, equal segments that are divided. And then is this something different than just centering your subject? So this is all subjective, but it's something I just have in the back of my mind. When I approach a scene, I try to pick it apart and consider like which angle would be ideal and how many different angles can I get to. Sometimes I think about how many photos I can create from one shot if I were to crop it and rotate it. So if you start to do this practice and think in thirds and think proportionately. Uh, you can just imagine you're out there, you're scanning the ground, you're looking for mushrooms or anything really. You can look at um, a leaf hanging somewhere and you're like, how would I walk up to that right now? And how would it play out? Like, how would I shoot that? to get like the best lighting and the angle. And as you start playing these games, you're doing like photography uh, mentally in your mind. Cause sometimes I'll leave and I forget my camera 
And I'm like, dang, if I only had my camera, like, how would I do it? And it just becomes like a natural creative process. Um, and it's fun. So the original image of this cordyceps was off center. It was further out. All I did was rotate it and cropped it so that the vertical and horizontal guiding lines like aligned. So your attention is drawn to the sporangium, to the parathesium, to the, to the top part. And then it's centered, but the proportionality of it, um, I, th I think, in my opinion, is, is good. It's centered. So when I was in Saba in Borneo at Kinabalu Park, I was on this trail that had recently had some of these huge trees that fell down and it blocked my path. So being that I'd already come this far, I was like, I'm not turning back. Uh, I managed to climb through all these trees and I was rewarded at the end immediately by these really bright yellow and orange cap quaternary species. And it was coming out. They were coming out from this small mossy nook uh, at the base of this tree. And instinctively, I felt like this trio was poking out from their hole. So I tried to compose the shot so that they were more to the right side of the screen. And I just divided it up like there's three mushrooms here. So one and a half of them will be in the center, the other one and a half to the right. And then the far left would just be uh, greenery to provide more juxtaposition. And then your attention is drawn more to the right. Um, like I said before, this is all subjective. This is just like my thought process for how I would compose the shot. Um, having enough buffer room between the top and the bottom. Uh, yeah, just trying to make it fit nice within the screen. Uh, and this one right here uh, was a single shot, uh, not a composite, not a stacked photo. This was back in New Zealand. This is a Mycena interrupta or a Pixies parasol. It's a Gondwanan species. And we as humans like to anthropomorphize things. And I think it reminds me of like a little blue eye looking back at me. Um, and maybe you can't see it on your end, but the front part of the cap, it's like slightly out of focus. Uh, this was back when I wasn't stacking images. So it, it bothers me still, but um, I ended up just putting this so that the cap aligns with the left and the bottom part of the middle um, middle uh, grid there and it just fits uh, nicely in the background. The bouquet is all right. Um, yeah, so if you just think in thirds, like the bottom part is like your foundation. The middle part is a transitional area where the action is happening. And then the top part is usually the bouquet uh, that brings your attention back to the main subject. This is just my opinion. You can be creative and play around however you like. So like I mentioned before in that other photo, the front part was not in focus. And it was around this time that I learned, hey, it's like you don't need to be tapping your screen to get the focus point. On a manual camera, when you are rotating your lens, on most cameras, they have a focus peaking feature. And this is like a visual overlay that assists, assists you in setting your focus point precisely instead of guessing whether or not certain parts of your subject are in focus. And you can change the color. I prefer red. You can do yellow, white, blue. Other cameras have different options. But this is a game changer because here I am rotating, trying to focus in the front and I take the photo and it's still out of focus, it's because all oh, my eyesight isn't that good. This is a great visual overlay that assists and helps you focus in the front. Uh, so yeah, look for the focus peaking uh, setting on your camera. So for this last part, I'll cover what software I use and how I go about stacking my shots. And then also a brief overview of my workflow. Part of taking uh, these photos when I go out and I do focus bracketing, I'll come back with like three, four, five thousand images on my SD card. And that might sound like a lot, 
But what really helps is using software like Helicon or Zerene. These are the two that I know that are on the market. Uh, with Helicon, uh, I pay for just a year and then it renews every year. I think it's about 50, 60 bucks. I need to look it up. But uh, both of these offer free 30-day free trials. Um, Zerene Stacker, I've heard, is way better. It takes more time to process. But if you're going to look into manually stacking your photos, these two I highly recommend. You can try them out. Um, I just go with Helicon because it's quick, fast. It does the job. I also use uh, sometimes Topaz Photo AI. Uh, it does denoising, sharpening, upscaling. Uh, I'm not trying to be a salesman here, but I try to limit as much work as possible on, on the other side. I'm not really a tech kind of person, and I find these to be really easy to use. Uh, it's just click, drag, and drop. Uh, Adobe Lightroom, you can use that. It's also an app on your phone. So you can go ahead and just change the brightness and enhance the image. You can sharpen it. You can do a lot of different things with Adobe Lightroom. I won't get into it, but it's both a an app and a software. And then lastly, uh, cloud storage. Storage is a huge issue when you're taking lots of photos and you're trying to stack. So I use Microsoft OneDrive. Uh, it's a website and an app. So when I end up taking my photos, I ended up putting it into like OneDrive folders so I can access it on both my uh, phone and my desktop. I think you can get a terabyte for like 130 bucks a year. Um, everything has a subscription, but it's something to consider. Or you can just get a normal hard drive, plug it in, easy. So I, I keep mentioning this over and over, but focus bracketing, um, to be clear, is like assembling a sharp puzzle from like several photos. And each photo captures a different slice of the scene in clear focus. And when it's combined, they create one image where the entire subject from front to back is sharply in focus. It's like similar to layering multiple transparent sheets and then each with a different part of the drawing in focus to create a complete detailed picture. And then each layer or image has a focus distance called a differential. And at the end, I'll show you a chart and what other brands refer to a differential as. Um, but this ranges from narrow to wide. The smaller the number, the more slices or images will be taken at a smaller f-stop. So I like to keep mine at around two. Uh, the narrower uh, side is better. Um, I just think of like sliced bread and it's like, how thin are these slices of bread? And then each photo as it's being taken is going back further and further to get the whole loaf in focus. Um, you might encounter uh, overlap and some other problems like light halo. So I would just recommend figuring out what focus differential works for you. Um, yeah, this part right here, wide to narrow. Like I said, I like to keep it narrow. So my camera can technically take up to like 999 shots of detailed captures from you know, small to medium subjects. Um, it just depends on the size of the subject. You can play around with this. I won't get too much into uh, this technical side of things because it involves tinkering around on your own end. Personally, I like to set my shot limit to around 200, 300. The differential is around two. And then my aperture, depending on the size of the subject, will be uh, maybe f2.8 up to f5.6. Uh, just depends, like I said, on the size of the subject. So here is a, a calistoma that I found in Borneo. And I'll just show you here using Helicon. What I do is I pick out 
see there's 35 images. And then I highlight over, I zoom in. Okay, that's in focus. Hey, you know, that image, that's in focus too. I always try to shoot from the front and then go back. The ones that are out of focus, I'll remove them. I trim them, I delete those. And then as I'm going down, it's set, you can see it's set at different focus points. It moves through. So then I get down uh, towards the end. And then I look at the edges always say, hey, that's out of focus. It's blurry. It's not defined. So I find where um, just where that, that point is where it's still in focus. It's like here, it's like some small, tiny uh, details on the edges there. Those are in focus. So then I know that I can delete or remove all the ones after that. And I'm left with 27 images. I believe this was taken at an aperture of f5.6. Uh, I always use method C or pyramid. You can play around with that. And then I just render. So the software will go through and put every one of those photos together. And it's really cool to watch. It's like a moon landing. So that's it. Uh, I, I'll check it again. You get a whole lot more detail. You're getting that depth of field. The entire subject is in focus. Uh, I do one last you know, zoom around to make sure nothing's out of place. Or maybe I, I might find an insect or something that I couldn't detect with the naked eye. So uh, here's the final image. Uh, this is not an artsy type of photo. This has no bokeh. It's just a purely scientific representation of this mushroom. When you shoot macro, all that means is it's one-to-one. -one. So what you see right now is like a one-to-one -one representation of this uh, mushroom. And, uh, to get that full black background, I used to use Photoshop and meticulously go and try to like black out the background. There's a new website, adobeexpress.com, I think. If you go to Adobe Express, they have free tools that allow you to remove the background. So because the background was already black to begin with, um, I just went there and chose remove background and it produces a nice image and just does the heavy lifting for you to separate your subject. Here's another example. So this is a really tiny uh, bolete type of mushroom, porous mushroom. Once again, I'm you know zooming in, looking at the stipe, seeing how much detail there is and how much I can remove. And um, yeah, as you can see, you can see spores in there. I'm going around the edges mostly to make sure that it's in focus. And then, yeah, like I did before, trim, remove the ones that are out of focus. I'm left with 14 images. Uh, smoothing is set to one. Method C, pyramid, I just quickly stack it. Uh, the aperture on this was maybe a four, four and a half. You can get even more detailed if you do a lower number, like f2.8. This is just 14 images. You can get it up to like 50 images and get even more detailed if you want. Uh, I experience light halos, though, where it's blurry on the outside and the light overlaps, and it's really a, a headache to do post-processing. So um, I just felt to do... Um, this is the final result. I like the green background. It accentuates the red, uh, the juxtaposition. I like that word, <laughs> juxtaposition uh, is nice. And then to maybe tell a complete story, you can do uh, something creative, like put a coin next to it to show uh, for scale, coin for banana for scale. This is coin for scale. Um, this was a really tiny one. 
uh, tiniest porous mushroom I, I found. Um, yeah, you can use a ruler if you want and just uh, yeah, get creative. So like I said, usually after a foray, I'll have like two, three, four thousand images. So I can the SD card into my reader and I transfer all these files to my desktop. Sometimes it takes like 20, 30 minutes. So I'll put on a cup of tea. I'll go uh, take a shower, do something else. I come back and then I just put all the images into a folder. I name it with a location. And then I, you, you become uh, better at labeling things because um, before I would just click drag and drop and I'm like, where the heck is this? And where's that? And it's like, as time goes by, you develop your own um, system of labeling and uh, tracking down some of these photos. Uh, like I said before, I use a final folder at the end and just upload it to OneDrive. So it's easily accessible on, on multiple devices. Um, yeah. So here's some other photos I've taken. This was in Wawasan in KL. I was with uh, my friend Siu, um, Giok, uh, Eric Cho. Uh, we were out just going on this foray and um, found this amazing purple, dark purple tylopilus. And I took a photo with, you know, a brown leaf or foliage in the background in situ. And then I was able to get the pores underneath. Um, yeah, it's really cool when you find one mushroom and you're able to take different aspects of it and get, you know, three, four, five different mushroom shots. This is another one of mine uh, taken in Penang. Uh, it's an island in the northwest part of Malaysia. It's close to Thailand. Uh, this is a pisolithus, also known as like a pea stone mushroom. Uh, when it's broken in half, you see these little spore nuggets. I think David Aurora actually mentioned that um, pisolithus is like rice crispy stuck in tar. But yeah, if you're able to um, do different things with mushrooms, like cut them open or bruise them. You'll have different reactions that occur. There's um, a lot of detail that's hidden within mushrooms. Sometimes the most interesting thing is just opening the mushroom or looking underneath or just finding different patterns. Like this one here is a Belitnellis found in Malaysia, uh, in Kuala Lumpur. On the top, it's brown. It's unassuming, but underneath it's beautiful. You've got uh, a evolutionary kind of um, indecision. It's pores or gills. It's it's halfway, and this one actually bruises blue, so it's related to a, a belit. Um, but yeah, I just like this because you can take the one photo and then crop it, upscale it on topaz. Um, it takes maybe like five minutes in all in all to get the other image and you can play around with it um, some more and then upload it to OneDrive. And this one here also found in Malaysia in Bukit Gassing, uh, cat's tongue, pseudohydnum. Uh, yeah, just take one photo and then crop one part of it and you can enhance it. Or when you're doing stacking, you don't have to do that much post-processing. Just crop it and it's good enough. I like this because uh, the teeth just look really cool. This is a hygrocybe, really tiny. Uh, once again, maybe like 40 images stacked, 30, 40 images at a uh, wide aperture, f2.8. Um, if you zoom in even closer, you can see the spores on the gills under there. And once again, a red mushroom, try to get that uh, green background for juxtaposition. Then yeah, here's another one I took of a Cookiena tricoloma or bristly tropical cup found in Langkawi. It's another island north of Penang in Malaysia. 
And yeah, this was about 50 images stacked. And I'm using an LED light. Um, yeah, just, I got five leeches trying to take this one, but it was worth it. And when you stack these images too, you can see there's more depth. Um, you're getting details of the hairs. Um, yeah. So like I mentioned at the beginning, there is um, different terminology for uh, different brands of camera. I put together this chart so you can screenshot it, save it for later. Or if you're looking into buying a camera that has focus stacking ability, on the right is maybe I think the oldest camera model uh, available for that brand that has that feature. So um, just do your research before. Um, yeah, for focus bracketing, it's called focus shift shooting in Nikon. And some of these cameras, the screen will turn off. Uh, it'll just be black and you can't really see what's going on. With the OM system, the Olympus cameras, you can see it in real time, changing the focus and moving through the subject. Uh, yeah, the differential um, for the focus increment is what it's called on Canons or the on Sony's is as a percentage. So, and lastly, uh, if you'd like to learn about shooting bioluminescent mushrooms, uh, when I was in New Zealand, I found out that a certain type of armillaria glows in the dark. And then I started going down this rabbit hole and I got obsessed with trying to capture uh, glow in the dark mushrooms. And at Pedernales State uh, National Park there, a state park there, I, I went and was looking for Omphalotus subaludens, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, the southern jack-o'-lantern. And I was lucky enough to find one and it was glowing. Um, so because now from this talk, you know the exposure triangle, if you apply some of those techniques, you can capture bioluminescent mushrooms with a uh, DSLR camera. And if you Google uh, how to photograph bioluminescent mushrooms, the first link that pops up should be my website, michaelnear.com. And there is a step-to-step -step guide that I give uh, for free for like how to take glow-in-the-dark mushrooms. Also, Alan Rockefeller, uh, he's a huge inspiration. He takes amazing uh, bioluminescent mushroom photos as well. And he has some stuff online. Um, yeah, so like once you know how to use your camera, you can get creative and tinker around and capture a lot of interesting things. And not just mushrooms. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope that you guys learned a little bit. Um, I've been rambling on and on, on and on. Now, uh, I just had my coffee earlier. So, yeah, <laughs> I think I've, I've covered enough. Um, also, if you have like any questions, um, maybe I can answer those. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's been a few that people have been putting in the chat. This was really great. Everyone applause, applause, applause. Good job on your first Zoom, very informative. And just so everybody knows, the um, recording is out on our YouTube. So if you signed up, you should, should get a link in the email to the recording. So you can always play back and um, catch up on the details or take notes. Um, but yeah, so the first question we had was from Ward. Ward, do you want to um, ask your question? Let's see if he's still here, because I can ask for him too. So he asks, um, do you have all your equipment contained in one pack when you go into the field, or do you have to carry multiple bags? So everything I have fits in a backpack and takes up maybe 50% of my like school backpack. Um, I have one uh, carry-on that I bring with me whenever I travel. So the weight 
of everything, including my clothes, my toiletries, everything I need, weighs less than seven kgs or uh, 15 pounds. So the gear that I bring with me out to the field, super lightweight. Uh, I have the side pockets. It all fits. It's very modular. Um, I try to limit the gear that I have, but basically uh, it all fits in a camera bag. So I have my camera, my lens, and just a, a bag within a bag. So I can just pull it out, attach it to the tripod. I hold the tripod and the camera with me as I hike. Um, super lightweight. I attach everything and it's just, as soon as I see a mushroom, I can just put the tripod down, take the shot, done, next. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. It all fits in a, a little backpack. Nice. Great. Um, could you also put uh, go back to the screen where you have the list of equipment so people can kind of see that longer? So I think that's like a good, good um, page too. So um, Arvela, she asks, how do you, you place the black velvet in the field? So the black velvet I got has a sticky background, like a sticker. Uh, as you can see in the photo, uh, you can peel it off. So I can stick this to uh, the back of my backpack or mm -hmm. the small camera bag. So if I'm out somewhere, I can plop down my backpack and then sticking onto the back of the backpack is the black velvet. It also helps that I have a black backpack, but you have to use the velvet because it's non-reflective. Because mm. I found that I was trying to just use my backpack only and it's actually reflecting a little bit and it involves more post-processing and time. So yeah, I just have the, the sticky back on those. Uh, I have friends that use cards like that fold so you can make like a TP and mm. you prop it up that way. Um, I find that it's better to use the black when you have really tiny mushrooms that you're trying to capture detail and not have that stray light come in white, little brown mushrooms, LBMs, you're trying to get that detail. But then after a while, I noticed that your photos start to look a little too sterile or scientific, not artsy. It's more precise. It's if you're trying to take photos that focus mostly on the morphology of that mushroom and the details, but not its in situ mm -hmm. uh, aesthetics. So I guess the easy thing is when you plop down that backpack, you can just pick it back up again and you can take two photos, one with and one without. Mm -hmm. just e it's just easy to do I remember one time I was out in Kuala Lumpur with my friend and I did that and she goes aha I know your secret now so a lot of my friends start doing the same thing they'll just put that behind uh, and change their environment yeah yeah Mari do you want to ask your question this is about a camera yeah sure can you hear me Yes. yes. Oh, great. Uh, so I was looking at the Olympus DG6, which is like a tough camera of Olympus for like more adventure and quick photos. And it has really good macro settings too. I was wondering if you have any experience with it. Um, if you can talk a little bit about it, if you have any, an opinion about it. So Thank I was you actually so much. thinking. It was great. Oh, no. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, actually, it's great that you mentioned the TG6 because I know a lot of people that use that. And I was considering getting the point and shoot myself because it's waterproof, shockproof, it's easy to carry. Uh, there are Olympus TG6 groups, uh, photography groups on Facebook. There's a butterfly macro mode. Uh, it does in-camera focus stacking. I didn't want to get this camera because 
uh, in-camera focus stacking is limited to maybe 12 to 15 shots. Sometimes I need 50 or maybe 100. And I need my differential to be you know, low and I need more detail. It's a good camera. Uh, if you're taking photos of maybe medium to large mushrooms, but those really, really tiny ones, you want to be able to have control over how many shots you can take. Also, in-camera focus stacking crops your image around the border a little bit to compensate for the depth that it gets. So you can do a point and shoot with your Olympus TG6. Like, keep in mind, you're, you're only going to get like 12 to 15 uh, images stacked. So I would recommend going out and looking at what other people have been able to capture. And if that's something that you want, um, then by all means go for it. But for me personally, just for a little bit more money to have the manual mode and having complete control and then the ability to have that lens um, on there, it gives you that more, more of that detail that you want to get. But TG6 is, an, is a great camera. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so helpful. Yeah. Thanks. So um, how can how can folks get in touch with you if they want to um, have you do a class with them, with their group, or um, if they have questions? And we're, we're going to get through a few more questions here tonight, but just in case people want to you know, come up with a question down the road. So I, I uh, have an Instagram, Mike O'Neill, and then a website. I use Substack. Uh, it's for free for now. I don't charge for anything like no paid subscriptions yet. Um, so I have maybe like 45, 50 uh, blog posts or newsletters on my website, mikeoneer.com. And there are different sections um, for bioluminescent mushrooms. There's like stories about forays that I've been on and I share my photography on there. So if you're interested, uh, smash the like and subscribe button <laughs> or just yeah, hit me sure. up on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hit me up on Instagram. Um, send me a message. I love to talk about Yay. everything, everything mushrooms and photography, especially so. Yay. So lots of good comments from everyone. Allison Pollock says, great job. Yay. <laughs> Love your photography too, Allison. Um, yeah, I learned, a, I learned a lot from Allison as well because my friend told me about how to fix some of my light halo issues. So yeah, she gave me some good advice to get rid of those. Her photos are amazing. That's next level. Um, if you're looking for extreme macro photography, like mixomycetes, <laughs> I highly recommend. Yeah, Allison. Um, also, my friend in Malaysia, uh, Siu, mymixos.my. If you go to her Instagram, amazing extreme macro photos where they use actual microscopic uh, objectives and they shoot in a vacuum and it's mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> So Reese, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hey. Hey Reese. Hello. Hey Joe. Hey, so I just got in the macro uh probably about a week ago. I got a similar setup with the Mark II. Uh, okay. uh I'm having trouble with photo editing, like post processing stuff. I'm got pretty comfortable with the ring, but Lightroom, I'm having a lot of frustrations. Do you use the Lightroom library system? Yeah, I use Lightroom. I just got the Adobe Creative, what do they call it? Creative Cloud Suite. Um, and I have the desktop version, which is a bit fiddly. Have you tried the app? No, not yet. Yeah, the app is more intuitive. Uh, if you're comfortable just using your thumb on your phone, uh -huh. play around with that first. It's free. I like free. So yeah. uh, it, tr try out uh, the app. Um, I have played around mostly if you press the auto button, it will mm -hmm. automatically enhance the photo for you. So that's like a good starting point. And then when you 
pull it up, you can say, you know what? Maybe ease up on the highlights, ease up on the the black of the shadows, make it a little right. bit more overexposed, underexposed. You can tinker around a whole lot easier. And then, like I said before, I use uh, OneDrive. So I just save it to the cloud. Um, yeah, try the app out. Okay, thanks. I, th I think that that's the, the key is just learning to have fun with it. Yeah, it can get real <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. All thanks, right. Reese. So we'll do um we'll do a quick trivia giveaway and then we can all kind of chat. I know Alan's on here too. He might have some some tips and stuff. I know him and um before everybody joined, we were chatting about different things. So if, if people want to stick stick around and do a little chit um chat after this, but I'm gonna drop the trivia question in the chat. So make sure you have your chat up ready to answer. And again, we'll be giving away this book called The Little Book of Mushrooms, um, written by Alex Dorr, illustrated by Sarah Richards. So I just posted the question in the chat. So first person to enter the correct answer will win. And I just need to get your, um, your address, so. You'll have to send it to me on our email. And you can use Google too. <laughs> you don't know the name of the species on the top of your head. All right, Reese. Yeah, you got it. All right, Reese, if you could just send me your address and I'll get that out to you in the mail. Good job, everyone. All right. Yeah, so any other feedback? I know um, uh, we're talking about all different types of topics to just even DNA and whatnot, but this has been a really great, great chat. Yeah. Hopefully I wasn't rambling on talking too no. fast, too many, too many words per minute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you did great. All yeah. Right. Really good cadence. I liked hearing your backstory. That was really great. Um, so yeah, Alan, are you still on or are you? Or did you have to drop off? I know he was doing a survey, probably getting dark where he is too. Mm. Yeah. Also, if you guys want to come on out to Asia, go on some mushroom hunts. It's yes. really amazing. Uh, it's super cheap to fly out. Um, if you do credit card rewards, that kind of stuff, like churning, travel mm -hmm. hacking, come on out. Um Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, super friendly. They speak English. It's very uh, easy to access a lot of forests. Um, you have a mix of city and forest, so you can enjoy the conveniences of the city and just pop into the, the bush and come on do out mushroom yoga. hunting. Do some bush Yeah, <laughs> do a little forest, forest bathing. <laughs> Yeah, the door is always open. Hey, Joe, this is Gabby. Can you tell us your Instagram again? Uh, Mike O'Neer, M-Y-C-O-N-E-E-R. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I try to keep up with that social media, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even use my personal account anymore. It's just only mushroom photos. I can only handle that. Uh, yeah. I mean, the algorithm will take over pretty quick too. There's like certain to other topics I used to be interested in. The more, more involved I get in the mycology community, I'm like, mm. what happened to this person? <laughs> like I never see their stuff anymore. I'll go through like my photos. Where was I on September you know, 10th? And it's like, oh yeah, I remember that much from species. So I must've been there. I joke mm -hmm. that there's never a mushroom I, I've met that I, I haven't forgotten about. So I use those as like anchor points. So like that yes. blue Mycena, it's like 
uh, nostalgic. It's like, oh, I remember where I was when I saw, saw that one. Okay, that one must have been there in that month. And yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So Alan, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. Did you find any mushrooms at the on the campus today? That saw him come on mute, but he might be. Yeah, I saw he was in like some wood chips around the campus there, I guess, yeah, doing a survey. That's cool. All right. Well, anybody else? Any other thoughts from anybody else? We'll end the live stream if we don't hear from anyone else. <laughs> I had a couple thoughts on cameras and lenses. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I just had to leave and rejoin. Um, anyway, really good talk, and you covered a lot of cool things. One thing is that there's a new lens out, the 90 millimeter Olympus lens, which gives you twice as much detail as any of the other lenses because it has two times magnification. And then they have the two times teleconverter, so you can get like four times magnification. So if anyone wants to get really tiny things without having to take it back um, to a studio, then that 90 millimeter lens is definitely the one to get. And that works on most micro four thirds cameras, including those Olympuses. I wish I could afford it. It's like, oh man, super expensive for the teleconverter as well. My friend has that set up and the tripod that I recommended the MT20, the Alonzi one, it gets top heavy. So mm -hmm. you need to upgrade your tripod as well. So if you're going to get that camera, maybe don't get the MT20 like I recommended. Maybe get a sturdier tripod. But yeah, I wish I had, wish I had the money to upgrade to that because that's the next step. I've seen some amazing shots with the 90 millimeter. Alan, do you have uh, OM1? Do you have that camera or? No, oh, I have Nikon. Uh, nice so I can okay. only use the uh, so I can only use the sixty millimeter lens, um, you know, one hundred whatever. Uh, pretty much the same thing for mushrooms. I like the sixty millimeter lens. That's, that's that's pretty much the only lens I ever use. Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, it's the fifty millimeter ZMC macro lens. Um, but also, I had a couple of thoughts on the TG six, and that is that the the photo quality is very similar to a cell phone. So if you have a cell phone, there isn't really a lot of uh, reason to get that camera. It's slightly better, um, but not like enough to, uh, to really get it. So I always tell people like don't, like, don't bother getting one of those and just get a real camera and macro lens if you want to take macro photos. And if you don't want to do that, then just use a cell phone. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So someone on the Zoom actually, or sorry, on the YouTube actually asked if you were, if you wanted to kind of inch your way into, um, into mushroom photography, just starting with cell phone, like what would be like the best cell phone out there, uh, like to get right now? I would say the Samsung S23. I've seen some really nice macro things on on those and the video is pretty good um one more thought about the tg6 though is if you're going to get it definitely get the ring flash attachment okay. yeah i started out with the google pixel 3 um just because at that time it said oh the camera is amazing for it and mm -hmm. yet yeah, the the advancement in camera technology on the phones have gotten like really good i haven't seen like the latest iphone i don't know if you're you know android or iphone whatever team you're on but like uh huawei also i've had some friends in malaysia that use huawei um or i don't know this other camera um if you follow uh lenny wong on instagram or look her up she takes cell phone photography that's really good um i have to 
You said Lenny Wong. Yeah. Uh, I, I used the Pixel 3 as well for a while, and I had the a Moments lens. You know the Moments lens that was available as well? It's just It like, attaches to it? It attaches like, the, like a macro uh, lens. And that was a lot of fun to use, but I when I got my, uh, I upgraded to the latest Pixel 7 and, um, you know, they don't, Moments doesn't make cases and lenses that fit that phone. <laughs> and so now I'm like super bummed. Like, I don't know if my, but, um, yeah. My other friend, uh, Jerry, yeah, uh, at, Upricorn. Upricorn is her Instagram handle. I can send you a message. She uses a lens bong, just like a magnifier that she clips onto the end of the iPhone. And that helps get a little bit more magnification. Um, yeah, some decent photos from that. I think just getting out there to begin with. Mm -hmm. Once you find out, because you come at a, there's a crossroads you'll come to where it's like, hey, I'm spending like all this time out here taking photos with my phone and then you start <laughs> weighing up the cost of like, the time spent and you know what if i'm going to do it i should do it right and mm -hmm. then you make the decision to upgrade i wouldn't recommend going out and buying like all this expensive gear that ends up collecting dust you should learn like crawl before you walk and walk mm -hmm. before you run and see if you like it like, yeah you can handle being out their you know crouch down because it's not for everyone it's you gotta be super patient yeah and you got you gotta have time you have to have the luxury of time to spend maybe like three hours four hours outdoors and then when you come back depending on how long it takes you to learn the mm -hmm. post-processing um that could take maybe an hour or two mm -hmm. so you're looking at a, a time commitment not just out there taking the photos but then putting it all together um yeah it yeah, takes me as much time to process the photos as i spend in the woods yeah i'm trying to speed that up though i'm like a robot i'm just like all right here it's kind of a uh, meditative in a way to just turn your brain off and just be like all right here's and then there mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's even fun to do, but the more i learn about photoshop the longer it takes me to do each picture yeah. So, Alan, what hole. what uh what software do you use for focus stacking? Oh. I'm audio. sorry, it kind of dropped out, and I didn't get a question. Yeah. What was um what software do you use for your focus stacking? I use Helicon. Okay. And I was going to um, ask. Helicon method C. And then sometimes I'll combine method A and B and C. But for usually method C is the best I find. And so if you don't, Joe, you showed how you remove some of the out of focus um, photos. If you left those in there, does it just like make the photo more blurry out of focus? Is that what happens? No, uh, out I of focus photo no. like automatically, but then you lose a final image. Okay. Like, like for me, like I found on some of the methods I was doing, I get those light halos. Like there was an overlap. It was like, oh, there's more around the edges. If I left some of those photos in, and I wasn't trying to reduce it as much as possible, uh, less is more. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, it doesn't take that much time just to like go around the border and see like, oh, hey, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. take this from, yeah. One thing that Allison Polak showed me that really takes all the halos out right away is you duplicate the layer and then use content aware fill to remove the subject. And then you blur the background and then clone in the background from that other layer um, after selecting. Um, after like going back to your your first layer and selecting your object. Wow. Okay, so this is on uh, Photoshop. Or um, takes all of the halos away at the same time, 
So that can make things look really nice and it can be a lot faster than like going on the edges of, the, uh, of all of your mushrooms to like clean up those halos. Wow, you saved me a bunch of time. And I'm now looking back at old photos and I'm like, man, I wish I can get rid of those halos. I, so this is all on Photoshop, right, Alan? You duplicate the yeah, layer on Photoshop. I don't, and... in Photoshop. I, don't, I don't use Lightroom or anything like that. You know, the Adobe Camera Raw plugin, which is basically Lightroom. Uh, yeah. But if you do a quick zoom sometime, I can show you how I do it in Photoshop just because it's okay. a little bit complicated, like just the first time you do it. And after that, it's it's pretty easy. You said you shoot in raw. No, I never shoot in raw. Well, I shoot in raw twice a year, and then I I shoot in raw twice a year, and then I'll process the raws and process the JPEGs. And the raws are never any better. The, actually, the JPEGs look better than the raws. So um, yeah. People always say you should shoot in RAW, but in my opinion, shooting in JPEG is better. Uh, but it depends on how much dynamic range you need. If there's one part of the image that's really bright and colorful and the rest is pretty dark, I'll shoot that one in RAW. But mm -hmm. I don't know it actually helps. And I like to save all my input images. Um, another thing that I've been doing recently that really helps is I start the stack really early. So I start the stack at the of the nearest foreground. Uh, that way you don't get this effect where it's like blurry and then sharp and then blurry. Instead, it's just like really sharp in the foreground and then it's blurry in just the background. And mm -hmm. that makes it a whole lot nicer and more natural as well. You have on Nikon uh, focus peaking as well. So when you yeah, focus I don't it... use it, it's not that accurate. I find it's a lot better mm -hmm. for me just to like kind of like zoom in and uh, focus when I'm zoomed in on my, uh, you know, focus when I'm zoomed in on the viewfinder or just like focus way closer than I think I need because storage is cheap and I can always take a few extra pictures. Uh, then I don't have to worry about like the focus too much. And a lot of times there's like some part of the background that, a lot of times there's like some part of the foreground that then it's there, but they have those frames. So I saw from you, you use LED lights. I saw in a video you used a light wand or a stick. Uh, Ulanzi, I go on there, I get the light cube. Uh, what color temperature do you use? Um, I always set them to 9K. So that's like the bluest they go. That seems to be the best, uh, gives me the uh, most color so i was a little surprised that you said you set yours to 6k because that looks really yellow to me but personal preference really uh yeah because 6000 k uh is warm and it's also matches with the non auto white balance i know before you mentioned where you can do custom white balance where you take a gray card or a white card and just set that uh with the one touch on on the olympus they have this one touch where you can just do that to match the environment but I like to just set cloudy because it's at 6,000 and then doing a matching color temperature with the LED, it seems to turn out all right. Um, yeah, I, was I mean, every yeah. manufacturer is going to be totally different. But what I was doing today was I was using the K color balance and then just changing the temperature number until the colors looked correct. But mm. if you're not shooting raw, you definitely got to get that color balance pretty close to right in the field. Yeah. Yeah, because that's a problem where like people argue like, oh, you're beautifying and raising expectations for a mushroom that you shoot doesn't look like that in real life. Uh, so I try to match it what my eye sees. Uh, yeah, try to get I as close as possible. Post processing just make it look like it looked in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and recently, I've been using a lot more natural light. I don't use those cubes much anymore. Um, like it depends, really depends on what the light's like and what, I, what I'm going for. But if I can get away with natural light, I'll use it. Uh, but sometimes mm -hmm. I'll look at something and I'll just see that um, a little bit of extra light coming from this or that direction would r really help. So always best to shoot a, a few stacks uh, with the lights in different spots and in different intensities and just see what looks best later. Yeah. yeah. 
have you ever shot with like a bonnet, like a handmaid's tail bonnet, the diffuser and the flash? And I know a lot of people are into like the oh, Cygnus tech. And that. Um, I only use flashes when I'm doing night hikes for things like mm. spiders and amphibians and stuff like that. I think for something that does not move like a mushroom, then um, you don't really need a flash. So if you did get a flash and you use it, it, it can work really well. They're just kind of ridiculous looking and really big and kind of unnecessary um but um like you know Stu, um Stu pickel in los angeles he shoots everything with flash and his stuff turns out amazing mm -hmm. yeah i saw some of his photos he was in uh, new zealand for a while i think and in, in australia yeah, he yeah really nice yeah but you I have a good time there <laughs> yeah it was really great you know i went with joey from crime pays but botany doesn't and it was very fun we saw a lot of plants there went to a lot of crazy plant habitats and a lot of really interesting mushroom habitats too so yeah it was yeah. it was really neat we were traveling with miguel who runs the herbarium over in tasmania and he was mm -hmm. a really cool guy to travel with so um yeah that that was a great trip yeah next time though go to the south island man it's the best <laughs> if you get yeah, a chance to definitely like yeah. to check out the south island yeah i'm curious if either of you all um do like to do because you know it's such a like viral popular thing and of course like steve axford has like done a lot of the like time lapse photography um yeah is that something that that um either of you all like to do as well um in uh the, a popular mushroom is the phallus the stink horn that grows i've gotten some time lapse just with my phone uh, i used my my olympus before uh the quality of the video that steve does is just amazing i think he has a fungarium like a shipping container so he can have yeah. he has that controlled environment i don't have a home i live out of a backpack and i travel around a bit nomadic so I don't have the luxury of a fungarium where I can go and do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it would be amazing to have um, the setup and the time to do time-lapse. Uh, uh, slime molds, those are quick. Mm -hmm. You can do that you know, in a day or two. Uh, but yeah, you need consistent with... lighting. So, sorry, I haven't messed with time-lapses either. But Joe is correct. To get a good time-lapse, you have to take it indoors. And yeah. so you just like, you know, cut like uh, a square foot of the forest or, you know, br bring the mushroom all back yeah. while they're still attached to the substrate. And then you just got to do it indoor. Ideal is with some humidifiers so they don't dry out, um, like in a, in a garage or something that you can keep real humid. And mm -hmm. you can definitely get really amazing stuff. Um, but I never really messed with that. Yeah. I, I tried to do a, a white basket fungus it's like uh, one of the, the photos I showed earlier looks like a hollowed out soccer ball, but like oh, yeah. uh, it's an it's an egg. And I tried so hard to get this, but uh, the it just all of a sudden just popped out randomly, like super fast. So there's oh, no wow. I had my settings all wrong. So you need to maybe yeah. know the growth rate of that mushroom beforehand, like, and then do your settings for taking a photo once a minute instead of once every five minutes or once every, mm -hmm. you kind of got to gauge it and play around with it. I think to start with, maybe slime molds might be easier because they're so mm -hmm. quick. You can just video, video it maybe. Um, yeah. yeah. it's. But Steve Axford takes it to another level. Um, oh, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah, we had him do a talk like early in the pandemic when the planet fungi first came out. And that's when I learned he had a shipping container. I was like, oh, wow. But I, um, when I was wanting to, you know, photograph the star mushroom opening, I didn't know, like, you know, because I know that it's, I've seen how it's like attached to its substrate, which is like a root or like a the rhizoid. Stump. Uh, yeah. And it's like, what happens if it's when it's in its cigar morphology, what happens if I take it away from its, you know, food source is it going to continue to open up and continue its life cycle and um but yeah yeah no I, I think I saw one other person trying it out 
And so it's been really fun to set up. Usually it takes like about 12 hours for it to fully open. So it was, I just expected it to be like a really fast thing, but of course Mm. it depends on like the environmental conditions, the humidity. Um, So the more humid, I think the faster it will open. Um, But yeah, it's been an easy, fun thing to do with just cell phone. (laughs) There's a girl in Shanghai, a Chinese girl. I think her name is Ewen. I got to look up her Instagram, but she does really cool time-lapse uh, mixos of uh, slime molds. She went viral there on uh, Weibo on, on Chinese social media. She's got like, her parents were like, what are you doing with your life? You're going out there. <laughs> That's weird. And then she's like, oh, I got 5 million followers now. Look, mom, dad. <laughs> <laughs> but she'd go out to like the urban parts of Shanghai and find like sticks and leaves and she'd bring them back and do these really cool time-lapse videos. There's, I think she does, or might be Stu, uh, where they have the skull or like an alien and then you have the plasmodium uh, growing over the skull. It's yellow. Um, I'm trying to remember who does that. There's so many cool creative people out there. Uh, that that do the time lapse stuff. Yeah, yeah like that, that's the next. Of the, the cordyceps, like was that on planet Earth? Like that was Steve Axford too, right? I don't know. I mean, it was really tracking the ant. Are you talking about the one where it shows the uh, Ophiocordyceps unilateralis coming out of the leaf cutter mm-hmm. ant? Yeah, or the one where the the leaf cutter ant is eating the leaves and then bringing it back to the fungus. No, the, um, the um, Ophiocordyceps. Uh, yeah. To yeah, that, that was pretty legendary. Like that. <laughs> this, yeah. I don't know. We like to go. I have a friend who's obsessed with Cordyceps back in Malaysia. Her name is Elise. Uh, mm-hmm. You can follow her on. I'll send uh, a list of these people on Instagram. But she's obsessed with Cordyceps and we'll go out and we'll play a game like where's Waldo? Like where's the Cordyceps? And you'll see these little red anthers sticking out uh, from the wood and mm-hmm. uh, yeah cordyceps are a real interesting one I, I would like to photograph more of but it involves a bit of excavating uh, you need to be uh, good at cleaning because they mm-hmm. like to burrow into the ground and it involves more of a, a house cleaning to set that shot up but mm-hmm. yeah it's uh, pretty crazy stuff and mind blowing. Mm-hmm. The cordyceps. Well, cool, y'all. Well, this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks, Alan, for hanging with us tonight. And um, yeah, I don't have much more. I think I'm ready to sign off. Yeah, it's getting late over there for you guys. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's like nine, but yeah, it's um <laughs> past my bedtime. <laughs> Yeah, this time of year, it's like turn in early and get up early. <laughs> it's like 9 uh, o'clock at 6 p.m., it feels like. Mm-hmm. Hey, Ward. Hey, Joe. That was fantastic. Hey. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it was uh, good to meet you when I was there. Yeah, that was uh, July, I think. Yes, it was. Time. It feels like forever. Yes, it was. I I would love to get somewhere over there. My goal is by the end of 2025, I can travel abroad. I'm um uh, I'm selling uh some pretty good produce at the farmers market, and I plan on using uh the money to upgrade my camera system. Nice. nice. Yeah, I've been seeing your I, photos. I can't believe how long of a growing season we're having right now. Right. Same. It's my first garden, so I'm I'm really lucky. Yeah, it's a good, good year for gardening. Last night we had our first little almost freezing. It it probably froze where you were. Maybe not because you're more south. It got down to 27. Oh, shoot. Wow. I I covered my squash, and I planted late, and I've got squash, and I'm one of the only ones at the market that does, and I actually saved them. My tomatoes are toast. Yeah. 
but broccoli was good. I've got cold hardy plants in there, so um, I'm pretty good. Sweet. All right, y'all. Well, let's sign off. It was good to see everyone. And thanks again, Joe. And um, we'll send over your honorarium. And this was really great. I think you did it. Thumbs up. Lots of thumbs up. Good job. All right. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you, man. See Take ya. care. Bye-bye. I'll see you. Keep really in touch, Ward. Nice we'll do it. What's that? Oh, I just said it was really nice seeing you and hanging out and getting to talk to you face to face for a, a few minutes. Um, yeah, but yeah. I'll talk more online. For sure, Alan. Hey, I'm going to hit you up about bioluminescent photos. I'll pick your brain. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Angel, thanks for hosting. Hi, y'all. Have a good Take one. Care.